Hi guys and welcome today. We're going to be talking about the suit of swords starting today. I'm going to be uh, continuing my Minor Arcana series and today we're on the Ace of Swords. So uh, again we're going to be going to our Book of Taught and doing a close reading of this card. Uh, the sword suit is definitely a, one of the more complicated, one of the more abstract suits and so it definitely requires a little bit of um, a little bit of analysis here, which is fitting. So in the book we've got the Ace of Swords is the primordial energy of air, the essence of the Vav of Tetragrammaton, the integration of the Ruach. Air is the result of the conjunction of fire and water, thus it lacks the purity of its superiors in the male hierarchy, fire, soul, and the phallus. So he's saying that the Ace of Swords represents the element of air in its purest form, and basically is associated with the Vav of Tetragrammaton, the third letter. Of course, Tetragrammaton goes yod he vav he. Uh, this is, of course, related to the Vav. And the Vav is really the child of the union of the father and mother, uh, the yod and the he primal, the fire and water. Uh, while it may technically be considered an active element and therefore masculine in a sense, it is not as pure as fire, uh, which represents the sun and uh, the phallus. But for this same reason is the first card directly to be apprehended by the normal consciousness of mankind. The errors of such cards as the seven of, and ten of cups are yet of an order altogether higher than the apparently much milder Four of Swords. And then he says the study of the degradation of the planes is really difficult. Uh, and he's right about that. Uh, first of all, the interesting thing about the suit of air is that air is very much associated with mankind in general. If we think about the four Caribbean beasts that are associated with each element, the lion is, of course, associated with, um, well, of course, it's all the fixed signs of the zodiac associated with their element. So Leo represents uh, fire, and uh, Scorpio, in the form of the eagle, represents uh, cups and water, and the angel or man represents the suit of swords, and then last but not least, Taurus, the bull, represents uh, earth, but in this case we're talking about man and mankind, and of course the four main gospels of the New Testament are associated with those Caribbean beasts as well, and I believe uh, the man or the angel is associated with Matthew, actually, uh, which may or may not be interesting to you, uh, but uh, basically he says uh, that because this is the first suit that really partakes in energy that is below the abyss, below the supernal triangle and the idealism and deep philosophy contained in the supernal triangle, uh, the suit of swords is therefore um, much easier to comprehend by regular cognition. And it has very much to do with that, uh, those mental processes. Uh, and I agree that the understanding the real degradation down the, the, the planes of the Sephiroth uh, and how that all really works and feeds into each other is incredibly complicated, and it's something that I've kind of sort of talked about in some of these videos, depending on when appropriate, uh, but it's for the most part something that I, I kind of just <laughs> avoid and think on my own time, and I encourage you to do the same, because it's a long meditative process, and I don't know if there are really any concrete answers to the questions that are raised by that problem. But anyway, moving on. Uh, in nature, this obvi the obvious symbol of air is the wind, quote, which bloweth with, uh, whithersoever it listeth, end quote. It lacks the concentrated will of fire to unite with water. It has no corresponding passion for its twin element, earth. There is indeed a notable passivity in its nature. Evidently, it has no self-generated impulse. But, set in motion by its father and mother, its power is manifestly terrific. It visibly attacks its objective, as they, being of subtler and more tenuous character, can never do. It's, quote, all-embracing, all-wandering, all-penetrating, all-consuming, end quote, qualities have been described by many admirable writers, and its analogies are for the most part patent to quite ordinary observers. So... This is one of those typical Crowleyan paragraphs in which there's a lot of subtle symbolism being invoked here, uh, without the uh, run-of-the-mill reader necessarily realizing it. Uh, it is saying that it, it does not move of its own accord, which is very interesting. Uh, 
it does not set itself in motion. The only reason that the Vav, or the idea of air, has any motion in it at all is because it is set in motion by the father and the mother, represented by fire and water. Without that origin, air would not have any motion in it. But the problem is that it is much more aggressive, whereas the fire, the idea of fire and water is, are a lot more subtle, and um, as they exist more in the concept of the supernal triangle and are therefore less real, uh, air is, is the opposite of that. Air is real. Air is uh, very much manifest and therefore uh, can be much more aggressive in a much more visible and tangible way than the fire and than the ideas contained in fire and water. Uh, and the interesting thing is that this allusion to the twin element here, uh, it has no corresponding passion for its twin element, Earth. Now, this is sort of a weird thing to say, but I believe that it is uh, related to the idea the Vav being associated, and he talks about this later on, but the Vav being associated with the Sephirah of Tiferet on the Tree of Life means that the Vav can be conceptualized as representing, uh, if you've read the Book of the Law, it, it can be seen as representing Rahur Kuit, as uh, a representation of the Holy Guardian Angel, uh, as a representation of the magical will of the individual. And therefore, it has a naturally destructive connotation. And, you know, therefore, it, uh, Rahur Kuit, of course, is the twin god of Harpocrates. You read a lot about uh, this idea of twin deities in Tholemic literature. And that really is... Um, a very confusing concept. I've addressed the issue of twins uh, in some of my other videos on the Major Arcana on my channel. I believe I talked about it in my video on the Sun, because in the Sun card uh, in the Tot deck we really deal with that idea of twins. Uh, but you can conceptualize the the uh, the air and earth uh, elements as being twins, as really being uh, born of the same substance. Both of them are separate. Uh, separate entities given birth to by uh, the goddess, by uh, the goddess having been made pregnant by the god. Uh, so the union of, of fire and water creates this separate being that has both an airy quality and both an earthly quality. And these two elements are very much related to each other. Um, they are very much similar to each other, but one is active and the other is passive. And Hippocrates is associated with uh, the passive aspect, Earth. And this goes back into uh, this very odd doctrine that Malkut is very much the representation of Keter. Keter and Malkut are the same things, just in a different way. It just They have this reciprocal relationship. And so Hippocrates represents both Earth and and Keter in this sort of tenuous way. It's it's a very weird god form, uh, in my opinion, because, and, and you can read more about that in his essay on the Fool in this book. Uh, Harpocrates really is a pervasive symbol to represent Keter in all of its different forms, and the idea of pass passivity. Okay, uh, so that's kind of what he's getting at here with this idea of the twin element, which is why twin, if you look in the text, is capitalized. There is a reason for that. Uh, and there's a reason why he says that the Vav, uh, the, the power of the Vav is manifestly terrific. Uh, that is very much a, a quality of Rahurkuit, the, the active principle uh, in manifestation. Uh, so moving on, but it will be instantly be asked, then he goes on to this whole rant about how uh, basically in many doctrines, air and the element of air is associated with spirit, and that in, in, um, in different mythologies from around the world, uh, air is actually the source of all things. Air is, uh, you know, if you, again, read his section on the fool, and you'll find his reference to this ancient Egyptian myth about how air is the origin of all things. Now, and he goes on to say that 
uh, ruach actually, uh, which is the, the Hebrew word for um, mind that is associated with uh, the plane of Yetzirah, which is in turn associated with the plane of Vav, uh, that ruach actually means spirit. And so we, there's this big conundrum. Uh, it will be instantly asked, what is what of the status of this element in the light of the other attributes? In the Yetzirahic world, is not air the first element to follow spirit? Uh, is not Vayu the first emergence of the phenomenal form from the arcane obscurity of Akasha, which is spirit in the Hindu system? Uh, how may one reconcile the doctrine of mind with the fact that Ru, or Ruach, actually means spirit itself? Achat Ruach Elohim Chihim means one is the spirit, not air, of the gods of the living. And is not air the element attribute attributed to Mercury, also most properly the breath of life, the word of the Logos itself? So there's this big issue. If, if air is kind of a degraded element, if air is uh, active and sort of um, less inspired than uh, fire and water are, or particularly fire in this case, uh, then how do we deal with the fact that Vav is also associated with this very lofty idea of spirit and creation and the breath of life? So then he says uh, that the student must be referred to some less raw, cursory, elementary, and superficial treatise than this present bat-eyed, penguin-winged, blue-bottle-brained buzzing. Ha! Huh. Nevertheless, although air is in no system the lowest and so cannot cl uh, claim benefit of clergy from the doctrine that Malkut automatically resolves into Keter, the following reference seems not wholly to lack either cogency or pertinence. Which is to say that I believe he is alluding to some other something that most likely he wrote himself at a different time earlier in his career that perhaps uh, deals with this issue and he's basically making fun of himself uh, saying that this is very this is not his best work uh, largely Crowley thought that the Book of Taught was one of his less spectacular works and so uh, that is not uh, not far-fetched <laughs> to interpret it like that um, but he, he uh, goes on to say that the Ruach is centered in the, the airy Sephira Tifera, which we just talked about, who is the Son, the firstborn of the Father, and the Son, S-U-N, the first emanation of the creative phallus. He derives directly from his mother, Bina, through the path of Zayin, uh, the lovers, the sublime intuitive sense, so that he partakes absolutely of the nature of Neshemach. For, uh, from his, uh, excuse me, from his father Chokmah, he is informed through the path of He, the great mother, the star, Our Lady Nuit, so that the creative impulse is communicated to him by all possible possibilities. So ever, finally, from Keter, the supreme descends directly upon him through the path of Gimel, the high priestess, the triune light of initiation. The three in one, the secret mother in her polymorphous plenitude, these, these alone hail him thrice blessed of the supernals. So, it is, he is trying to legitimize this idea that air is still very much a sacred element and still very much is connected to spirit uh, and is still very much the idea of spirit made manifest in the material world and therefore being associated with the sun s o n and the sun s u n is therefore very much associated with the son of god the idea of christ jesus um any type of um self-sacrificing god God form. Osiris is also uh, applicable here, and naturally Horus is also applicable here. So, um, and the other interesting thing about this is that uh, this goes back to a very old Gnostic idea that the Redeemer is um, sent by the goddess, that um, that basically Sophia, if you, if you uh, have read anything about Gnosticism, and uh, I realize that this video is sort of touching on a little bit of everything here, but if you know anything, it is sort of important, uh, if you know the basic creation, Gnostic creation myth, uh, it's a lot like Pandora's box. Basically, Sophia, wisdom, the goddess, uh, creates materiality by accident out of curiosity. Uh, and basically, uh, the god of the lower 
domain ends up taking it over and basically running it the way he wants and runs it into ignorance to make all of the creatures that are made believe that he is the real god when in fact he is not. God is much greater and much more subtle and much more all penetrating than he is. And Sophia, the goddess Sophia, continually attempts to send prophets and wise men into the world. She blesses them with her wisdom to try to enlighten the world and bring it out of darkness and teach man and creation to reject the teachings of this lesser god, the Demiurge, as the Greeks would call him, otherwise known as Zeus or Yaldabaoth in the Gnostic texts, uh, otherwise known as a version of Yehovah. It all works, Yehovah being tetragrammaton. It all sort of fits in here, uh, sort of neatly. Uh, and, and this idea of the son, uh, the son of Tiferet being blessed three times by the goddess is very significant for uh, alluding to that myth. That is why he is arguing this. And he is also doing this to legitimize his switching of the path of the star with the path of the emperor. Because in the old Kabbalistic method, uh, the path of, of Tzadi, uh, or rather the path of, uh, of He, would still have been connecting uh, Chokmah to Tiferet, but it would have been associated with the emperor, which is a totally different connotation. And then we lose that idea of the feminine blessing the sun three times. And then his whole concept is thrown out the window here. Uh, but because he... His concept was that Saudi and He needed to be switched, and that therefore He is the star and Saudi is the emperor because of the Book of the Law. Uh, lots of information about this out there. I have videos and all sorts of stuff available if you have more uh, questions about this. Um, but basically, uh, he is now. Uh, aspected by the star connecting Chokmah to, uh, to, to Tiferet. Okay, so we get this. Uh, very powerful feminine force influencing him in this very intuitive way. We get the lovers, which represents uh, the listening to the spirit, listening intuitively to one's soul and the voice of the soul. And then we get the path of He uh, influencing him um, through the star to basically be a creative genius, to, to be able to create any anything whatsoever, really. And that's sort of where he gets this sort of lackadaisical, wind bloweth wherever it so willeth uh, quality to him, you know, without that uh, guidance and um, real restraint, in a, in a way, by, uh, by the priestess, without that connection to truth there, the Vav becomes all over the place and becomes very scattered and just really dangerous without check. Uh, and so the, the connection to the priestess and the middle pillar for the suit of swords is incredibly important. So um, all of these ideas very much are important to integrate for the student, I think, to really understand what he's getting at with this description of the Ace of Swords and what is really being said here, because there's a lot of, of deep doctrine being expressed in these paragraphs without it seeming that way. So really, I encourage you to read through this section on the Ace of Swords a lot. Uh, the last thing he says is the card represents the Sword of the Magus, uh, crowned with the 22 rayed diadem of pure light. The number refers to the Atun, also 22 equals 2 times 11, the magical manifestation of Hokma, wisdom, the Logos. Upon the blade, accordingly, is ascribed the word of law, Thelema. This word sends forth a blaze of light, dispersing the dark clouds of the mind. So the sword is labeled with Thelema and is crowned with 22 lights, obviously to represent the major arcana. Uh, it all 22, the number of the major arcana, is also the number 2 times 11. 11 being the number of magic, if we think of number 11, the, uh, the, the trump uh, lust, which is the uh, card representing magic par excellence in the taut deck. Uh, more so than the Magus itself in some ways. Uh, this, the number 22 therefore represents that concept of creative magical raw energy being multiplied by the Logos, Wisdom, the All-Father, uh, the principle of fire, that creative Logos. So it, it, the, the idea of Vav is very much the idea of that original creative impulse divided into many. Vav is the plenitude. Vav 
and air is all about the many as opposed to the unity. And that is where we fall into many dangers such as uh, oh gosh, the Five of Swords and the Nine of Swords, the Ten of Swords, all these really awful, gross, bad cards come from this idea of division, multiplicity, um, and the idea of the many interacting with each other and causing natural conflict. And that's really all it is. Uh, so the overall idea is that the Ace of Swords, being the purest idea of this concept of individuality, uh, really, I think, we need to see it as being representative of, of what air can be like if it is connected to that central idea of the priestess and the middle pillar and Keter and spirit. When it has those connections, then it represents the will of the magician. It represents clarity. It represents insight. It represents truth. It represents uh, coming to a conclusion. It represents... Um, a, really a flash of insight, brainstorming, all those things before we get to real butting heads here. So it's very pure thinking and it's very honest and truthful thinking. Um, and that's really it. Uh, and the whole idea is that, you know, of this word sends forth the blaze of light, dispersing the dark clouds of the mind. This is how he sort of wraps back in that idea of the sun being sent into the world by the goddess to dispel ignorance. And so the sun represents the lema, which is the law, which is in turn what has been sent to man uh, by the goddess in order to dispel ignorance. So, <laughs> There's a lot here trying to legitimize the lemma, trying to legitimize, legitimize the law and code of the lemma, which is strictly do what thou wilt, which is to pursue your personal, creative, natural course in life. Um, whatever connection to Godhead you have that you are being called to pursue, follow that and nothing else and ignore any other things that try to uh, sway you off that path. And that's really all it is. And let, let other people do the same. You know, do not try to interfere with other people's true wills, because if you do, you're asking for conflict. You're asking for disruption. You're asking to invite evil into the world, is what you're doing. Um, you're inviting aggression into your life. And that person, you know, whenever you infringe upon someone's true will, that person has the right to defend themselves in whatever means uh, they really see fit, uh, of course, abstaining from things like uh, violence, uh, obviously. Uh, personally, I don't condone, uh, as a teacher, uh, violence to support one's true will, but I do believe in defending one's true will and believing in it and uh, sticking up for it. You know, uh, but anywho, this is this was sort of a, a long video, but there really was a lot of information here. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them, and don't forget to subscribe, check out my new website, follow me on Twitter, and all that good stuff. All right, guys, thank you very much, and uh, take care.